1956, on the 9th of August, 20,000 women marched for justice against the past law. Changed something in our, in our nation. And uh, since then, we celebrate uh, August as Women's Month. And uh, so what we're going to do is this month, we're going to take a few stories of women who have changed things. Our God has used women. So for the next uh, four Sundays, we're going to focus around how God has used women. And um, we're going to... So I've got asked Lee and Bronwyn and myself and Richard are we gonna we're gonna preach um, this month around that around that uh, focus, and um, it's not because women are special and they are, and if you man you'll be thinking a whole lot of stuff, um, but hopefully it'll become clear about the heart of what we are wanting to do here. And um, we live in a unique South African culture. And we have to bow that culture to the kingdom. Whatever is unhelpful in our own past, personally, family-wise, your own culture-wise, we have to bow that knee and submit and become more and more what the kingdom of God looks like. And sometimes that's hard. Sometimes we blind to it until it's pointed out to us. So my prayer this morning, as we launch into this together, is that God would open our eyes, because ultimately, it's the things that we see that God gives us faith for, which transforms our heart, and later, we see the fruit which is behavior. We act differently. And so that's my prayer for as we go through this month um, on, on this focus. I can see she's got like a bit of a fire in her belly there trying to get some stuff out. I don't know. you know. Um, but let me just um, start with honoring this mm-hmm. woman. Mm-hmm. Um, ever since I met her, she's loved Jesus passionately, with unwavering focus. One of the things I love about her the most is she fights battles for people. She's fierce in keeping people free. She's fought for her own freedom. And in in the wake of that, she's created freedom for other people. And I say people because it's more than just women. And that for me is amazing. And um, I know her heart better than anyone in the room. Um, And here is a strong woman, but absolutely submitted. And um, I'm asking you to open your hearts because I really feel God's spoken to her. And there's going to be something of God's heart ministered. So would you pray with me for her? Father, thank you for gifts like Lee, and would you anoint her to proclaim, to break open, to open eyes, to break ceilings, to change mindsets. As your word comes, would it be so powerful, and Lord, we open our hearts, um, and would you come, and would your kingdom, would the fruit of your kingdom be seen, in Jesus' name, amen. On. Yeah, you're on it. Go for it. If I'm not, not sure. I'm a guy, so I'm not sure what to do now because she's crying. <laughs> I'm not sure what to do now. Um, if I could just ask you to just be gentle with me today. It wasn't me. <laughs> the presence of God is so real. It's so tangible in this space. How can we not be undone? How can we not be undone? 
I'm scared to share what I've got in my heart because I don't want to mishandle the word of this incredible God. And he loves you so much. And he has such plans and purposes for you. And time is too short. And things are too important for us to play around anymore. This God we serve, this lover of our soul, there is such a tangible invitation today, right now, on this the 7th of August, 2022, that if we just open our hearts, if we just bow our knee, if we just open our eyes and our ears, we will be forever changed. And those around us will be forever changed. I know today destinies are changing. I know today legacies are changing. That breakthrough in your life is going to come through into your children and your family and your siblings and the generation before you. If you stand before the living God and open your heart, we will be forever changed. That is the God we serve. There are no words. There's no wisdom of man. There's no preach. There's no cleverness. But Jesus... But Jesus, and all we can do is stumble around and understanding as best we can, but it's him. It's him. And so today as I just share what I've, what I've got, can I ask you not to hear my words, not to hear my thoughts, but to hear the living word of Jesus, the word of God given to us. Let it fall on the soil of our heart in whatever area it is that you need breakthrough, whatever area it is that you need victory, whatever it area it is that you need courage. Whatever area it is that you need grace for, that he will be what you need in that moment because it's him. So please just be gentle with me today. <laughs> um, so, um, yo, okay. So when I was asking God, I felt one of my, my heroes in the Bible is jail. So my, my title of my preach is Lessons from jail, not as an in incarceration, but lessons from this woman jail. I'm just going to paint you the picture in in um, Judges four. We know the time of the judges where it was the people were leading, and you know there were different judges appointed. Some were good, some were bad. Yada yada yada. We know the story of Deborah. So the the which guys was it the bad guys in the story? There's always different bad guys. It makes it complicated. So we've got this is the one about the Canaanites, the Canaanites. So in Judges 4, 14 to end, we've got this guy called Cicero. He's like this brutal terrorist guy. He's, he's the commander of the, the army, and he's just terrorizing the Israelites day in, day out. He's got like 900 chariots. Israelites got no chariots. And he's just tormenting the people of God. How many of us can feel like we're in a season where we're facing down 900 chariots? tormenting us, and we can live in these moments, but God has victory for us, but God can turn it. Um, so we know the story, there's Deborah, the prophetess, and Barak, the, the commander of the Israelite army, and so he doesn't really want to go to battle, and he says to Deborah, hey, Deb, if you come with, you'll do it. You know the, the whole story. Um, so they eventually they go into battle, and how's this for the really cool piece? So I'm just going to read it to you. God says it's so much better. So then Deborah said to Barak, this is the day of the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has the Lord not gone ahead of you? And I'm saying to River Life today, has the Lord not gone ahead of you? Has he not gone ahead of your situation? Has he not gone ahead of your trial and your tribulation? He has. Has the Lord not gone ahead of you? So Barak went down to Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him at Barak's advance. The Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and armies by the sword, and Sisera got down from his chariots and fled on foot. The troops fell by the sword, and not a man was left. Okay, so here's the interesting part. So it was routed, routed, whatever the thing is, by the Lord. If you jump to chapter 5, it says here in verse 20, From the heavens the stars fought, from their courses they fought against Sisera. The river Kishon swept them away, the age-old river, the river Kishon. March on my soul, be strong. Then the, thun the thundered, the horse's hooves galloping, galloping to his mighty steed. What actually happened was Sisera was trusting in his chariots. There was rain similar to this, flash flood. They all got bogged down. So these big chariots that gave them agility couldn't go anywhere, stuck in the mud. 
the battle happened and the Israelites won. So God did it through managing nature. So God gave the victory. It wasn't about man. So here's where the story gets exciting. My favorite chick gets in the story. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Canaanite, because there was an alliance between the Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the family of Heber, the Canaanite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. What's going on? So he entered her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. And she opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes and asks you, is anyone in there, say no. But Jael, Herb's wife, picked up a tent peg and hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep. Exhausted, she drove the, pen, the peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. Just then, Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I'll show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with a tent peg through his temple, dead. I love the way God keeps reiterating, dead. God wants to put things to death. Things that are not supposed to be in our lives. Things that are hunting us down, things that are harassing us, we need to put it to death. And today, I believe if we open our hearts, God is going to give us victory, just like with Jael. And on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaanites, before the Israelites, and the hand of the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin, and then destroyed him. Okay, so here's some stuff. Okay, just for a moment, I want to show you something. So, I'm a visual person. Tent peg. I asked my dad to make it for me. He's like, with superpowers. I just was like, Dad, I need a tent peg. That. There. Think about it for a moment. That's how brutally we need to deal with Satan. That's how brutally we need to deal with the enemy. This is not a thing to play around with. We can't have alliances with the devil. We can't have alliances with the ways of the world. We need to put the tent peg to the temple of the enemy in our life because victory is given by God. I am stirred by a tent peg. So I'm just going to give you some points. I kind of feel like one of those Marvel characters with this thing. <laughs> just, just some stuff here on, on jail. Okay. So, jail was going about her everyday life. Think about it. She was in her tent doing whatever tenty people do, probably sweeping out the dust and whatnot. She wasn't on the battlefield. She wasn't with Deborah out on the battlefield or looking for trouble. Trouble came to her. Are we ready when trouble enters the camp? Are we vigilant? What it looks like is she was doing her everyday life. Sisera ran into her space. Our space is our home. It's our workplace. It's our relationships. It's our thought life. Are we ready when Satan, when the enemy comes in on foot? Are we vigilant? And that's a challenge, hey, because we can compartmentalize where we allow God to have lordship in our life. We'll say you can have lordship on a Sunday between 9 and 12, or you can have lordship when I'm at home around the dinner table with my family. But do we allow God to have lordship in every area of our life? in the everyday battles. It's not always convenient or planned when we need to face down the enemy. Be vigilant, recognize him, and deal with him effectively. Second thing with Jael, she recognized Sisera. We've got to learn how to identify when the Satan comes in with an attack, when the enemy comes in to undermine. She took a stand, and she changed her allegiance. If we read the script, it says she changed her allegiance from Jadbin, the king of the Canaanites, to Israel. So there was a point in this woman's life when her family and her tribe were, had an alliance with Jabin, the bad guy, Sisera's boss. And in that moment when Sisera came into camp, she was faced with a decision. Do I give him safety? Do I give him a place of rest and let him run off? Or do I change history? Do I change destiny? Do I change, do I make a stand and change my allegiance. And I believe today God is calling men and women in this space to change allegiance 
of what you are partnering with. And it's a decision, and it's as impactful a moment, there is no take backs when there is a tent peg through a temple. We need to draw a line in the sand with the kingdom of God today that we are going to put to death some things in our lives that are not of him, some things that are distractions and wearing us down. And he equips us. Um, So she changed her allegiance. We can't have an alliance with sin. We can't partner with sin on the side. We can't have a little bit of porn. We can't get a little bit drunk. We can't have a little bit of tax evasion. How many things in our life do we just do a little bit? That's an alliance with sin. The time is coming because we serve a holy and righteous God that he calls us to be holy and righteous through his power, through his grace. But we get to make those decisions in our everyday going about cleaning our tent. Will we be in alliance with the kingdom of God or with the kingdom of man? It's that real. Um, The enemy we battle with is not a person like Sisera, but the Bible says in Ephesians 6, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present age, against spiritual forces in heavenly places. We wrestle against mindsets. We wrestle against ways of thinking. We wrestle against ways of processing our life. Because we live in a world and an environment that's bombarding us with mindsets and, and ideologies and things the whole time, and we get swept up in becoming like the world. But God has called us to be a people transformed by his word. We call to be a different kind of people. We call to think differently, to live differently, to walk differently. But how can we do that when we're in alliance with the enemy? It's time to put a tent peg to the temple of the devil. Um, there's just, I found this this morning. So I, I I really feel today God is addressing this thing of our thought life and the power of our thought life and the way we think and the way that we process. Um, There's this article, Dr. Carolyn Leaf says this in her book, Switch on Your Brain. As we think, we change the spiritual nature of our brain. As we consciously direct our thinking, we can wire out toxic patterns of thinking and replace them with heavenly thoughts. How powerful is that? We actually are not victims of our circumstance. We are not victims of thought process. We can choose. We can choose how we think. We can choose who we focus on. We can choose the perspective in any situation. We can choose. What are we choosing? What are we choosing? It's a hard one. When you wake up in the morning and you haven't had much sleep and you haven't had your coffee yet, I don't want to make good choices. But we have to choose. This is, this is the nuts and bolts living in a tent with the enemy running in. We have to choose. Um, in essence, Carolyn Leaf says, science is proving free will and relationship between thought and reality. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn how God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect, Romans 12, 2. Changing the way you think changes your perspective and changes how you act within the world. Paul's words aren't new. Change your mind is the central theme of Jesus' first sermon in Matthew 4. Jesus challenged people to change their thinking because regardless how many times you read through the Bible, if your mind doesn't change, you simply impose your bias and labels on the words that you read. We need to allow the word of God to change the way we think. We need to choose to allow the word of God to change the way we think. It says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. This is us engaging in spiritual warfare. This is us engaging in battle. This is what it looks like. Not necessarily Deborah riding out on the white horse onto the battlefields. It's us in our everyday life, in our everyday choices, on our everyday interactions, letting Jesus be Lord. Um, Where to go? To answer, uh, take every thought captive, what a great idea, but is it even possible? Well, if 
we trust God's word, we should know it was possible. The answer to capturing your thoughts is right here in scripture, hidden in plain sight. Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I am God. The powerful effects of prayer and meditation have been documented in recent years, again confirming Christians should already know. Capturing your thoughts requires stillness, something most South Africans and many Christians have no time for. And as long as we have no time for prayer, our thoughts, emotions, and feelings will continue to be calling the shots in our life. When I encounter someone like this, I leave wondering what an, autumn so- what an awesome source they take and I- where can I buy a jar? People who are different understand Philippians 4, 8, where they say they chose love. They chose to see the image of Deo, God's image in everyone. They choose good and they ruthlessly eliminate negativity. What you choose to see determines your reality. You have the power to change your reality by shifting your focus. Put your focus back on the holy and righteous God who loves you, who has pursued you, who has ransomed you. As someone thinks within himself, so he is. We are not victims of biology or circumstance. If you've chosen to believe otherwise, this verse sounds like hogwash, but again, science is proving what scripture already says. When you think, you build thoughts, and these become physical substances in your brain. I love the way God keeps going back to brains. (laughs) Think about it. The, um, yeah, so this is a big deal, people. It's a simple truth, but it's a big deal. It can change our everyday life. Okay, um, the third thing, Jael dealt with a problem. She committed to the course of action needed. We can't half kill the enemy. We can't half kill sin in our life. We can't half kill wrong mindsets. We can't dabble with an alliance with the enemy. We have to be brutal and take it out. Other thing I love about the story of Jael, which is part of the story that I dig, she didn't wait for the soldiers to get back and go, hey, there's this guy sleeping in the tent. Like, you need to take him out. She dealt with it. She got on with the business of things. I mean, she was like pretty smooth. This chick was like really good at, hospitable, at being hospitable. I love the fact that she went out to meet them. Hey, Cicero, come inside. Even when... Um, Barak came. She's like, hey, dude, like, he's here. She's engaging with people. She didn't change who she is in the journey. So she invites him in. He says he's tired. He says, can I have some water? She goes, oh, I'll give you milk. He lies down, covers him over with a blanket, waits till he falls asleep, and then gives him the eternal headache. The, um, but she didn't wait for someone else. How often in our life when we're struggling, we try and shift the solution to someone else. If somebody would just counsel me, if somebody would just pray for me, If I could just get five minutes with this person, I'd do it. I'd do it. I'm facing something, and instead of going to God, going to his word, I'm like, babe, (laughs) because it's easier. But Jael didn't. She got on with business. She sorted the problem then and there when it was in the camp. Don't let Satan take take root. The other thing, oh, sorry, my nose is running. (laughs) The tent peg. You know what this is for? I, I think it's beautiful that God used a tent peg and not like a knife and fork or something else. I mean, there was plenty around the house that you can get creative and use. You know what a tent peg does? It anchors ropes. When they set up camp, this little notch here, my dad cut in carefully, that's what you tie the rope to. A tent peg is an anchor. We defeat the enemy with the thing that anchors us. We defeat the enemy by the very thing that anchors us in life. We have victory. We have the solution. We have the tool. We have the weapon of our warfare. God is so kind if we would only pick up our tent peg. Um, Jael used the, tent, the, the tool that was at hand. It wasn't a spear or a chariot, just a wooden tent peg. What tool do you have at hand? We have the word of God, the, word of, the sword of the spirit. Ephesians six seventeen. for those of you that have your tent peg with you says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Hebrews 4.12 says, for the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirits of joint and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The tent peg is our anchor. The Word of God is what tethers us. What that means is, what does God say I am as opposed to the lies of the enemy? How does the word say I get victory over sin, over cyclical behavior, over wrong mindsets, over bad attitudes, 
I were doing things in my own strength. That was changing our thought process from Lee to the word. And that's a decision and an action. Keep the word readily available and at hand. Keep the word readily available and at hand. And then the second tool we have at our, at our disposal is prayer. Philippians 4.6-7 says, Don't be anxious about anything, about your job, about your kids, about the economy, about the petrol in your car, about your relationships. Anything means anything. Whatever it is you are wrestling with right now, it falls under the anything. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be known to God, and the peace which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I love how God's woven all of this together. It's so simple and yet so complicated and difficult. <laughs> we make it difficult. Never underestimate the power and effectiveness of prayer. Okay, the fifth thing with jail, God uses unlikely vessels. He uses donkeys to talk. He uses Jael to take out a terrorist. He uses Gideon, who was hiding away, timid, to, be, to bring victory. God uses unlikely vessels. That gives me hope because I'm an unlikely vessel. I'm a farmer's wife from Araby, but I can kick some devil butt. I am going to make a difference in whatever sphere I'm in, in whatever space I find myself, because it's not about me. I'm the unlikely vessel, but what fills the vessel is all-powerful. How filled are you with our living, breathing God of heaven? How much are you allowing him into your life? We are the governor of whether our vessel is leaking or not. Um, Jael was a housewife, not a warrior, but God used her. Strength can look like different things. Sometimes strength is speaking up. Sometimes it's extending compassion to the unlovable. Sometimes it's getting up just one more time and trying again. Sometimes strength is staying, and sometimes strength is walking away. We've got to hear God for our strength. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 11 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on us. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in hardship, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That is the God we lean on. That is the God we run to when things get on top of us. That is the God who has a preferred hope and a future for us if we set him as our true north. And then number six, our victory affects everybody. Jael defeating Sisera put the whole... Israelite tribe into freedom. Her taking out the enemy meant a whole lot of people didn't live in fear. It is so important that each and every one of us get victory in our personal lives for those who stand beside us and those who come behind us. It is too important not to take out the enemy. We talk about changing history. We talk about Shifting atmospheres, that happens when each individual in their space takes ownership of the call of God on their life in the place that they find themselves. They pick up their tent peg, they take out the enemy that's in their camp, and they walk in victory and they create a space for the great harvest to come through. We want revival, we have to be revival. We want to see Jesus break out, we have to let him break in to our hearts. This is... I, I'm overwhelmed at the patience of our Heavenly Father that He waits for us mere mortals to get it through our heads. He cares. He has plans. There is victory. I am so excited that God has given us a tent peg to take out the enemy in our life in whatever that looks like. And so, um, babes, <laughs> the, I just want to, in this moment, what is... What does the enemy look like in your camp? Is it fear? Is it depression? Is it hopelessness? Is it financial? Is it a relationship that's causing you pain and trauma? Is it a dream that's died, that's been robbed by the enemy? Is it a harvest that hasn't been reaped because the enemy's camping around the field? What is it? 
because I know the God who has given us what we need to take out the enemy in our life, to give us victory, to give us wholeness, to give us freedom. And it was a little old housewife in a tent because it's the God that comes behind us.